Douglas Herbert, our chief foreign editor, has been listening to that. He's with me now. Um, pledges of support, once again, yeah. uh, for Ukraine from uh, the Dutch and the Belgian leaders. But did we hear anything particularly new today? Shatteringly new? No. Uh, we have had those, you know, unwavering pledges of support, which have become, you know, commonplace when Volodymyr Zelensky makes the rounds of, of, of these institutions, the international community, visit, visits his allies. Look, he made a plea. For, uh, his laundry list remains what it's been for a long time. Um, perhaps there's more of a, a sense of urgency now because Ukraine has is on the eve, has perhaps been on the eve of, of a long expected, a long awaited counteroffensive, whether it's going to happen in the spring or now perhaps in the early summer. Uh, we still don't know the exact timing of it, but he made the plea for the West to step up to deliver as many weapons as possible now as soon as possible. The pipeline has been open. It has been flowing by all accounts. There's been a lot of heavy armor, uh, a lot of munitions, a lot of artillery uh, that has been delivered to Ukraine. Uh, Zelensky underscoring now is the time to make sure those deliveries do not taper out, that they continue to flow. He made uh, the case for stronger sanctions against Russia. We have heard the reports in recent days and weeks, and we've seen it, that uh, there have been many loopholes uh, found. The Russian economy has so far weathered uh, quite well uh, the, the, the sanctions. They are not ironclad. Uh, and so a, a sort of an argument for ways to tighten it. Seizing Russian assets has also become a big talking point when these leaders get together now. Uh, we heard uh, the, the, I believe it was the Belgian prime minister, who actually pegged the figure at about $200 billion in Russian assets uh, sort of parked right now abroad in, in, in Europe, allied countries. Uh, these assets, could be frozen. And one of the sort of ideas floating around that has been floating around is using the money from those frozen assets, essentially seizing them to then rechannel them towards Ukraine to help Ukraine with its reparations to compensate victims of this war. I think one of the main lines that came out any absolute new pledges? No. But what we did hear is at least a, a shout out to the idea of working on fighter planes. Uh, and this is something uh, that in the past had been sort of a red line. Uh, now sort of, you know, diligently looking at the question of F-16s. It doesn't mean it's happening tomorrow, but at least it's not completely off the table. This idea of uh, uh, freezing the Russian assets as well, this idea of using that money to perhaps help compensate Ukraine, help compensate the victims of this war. I will note that uh, the Dutch prime minister, before Zelensky spoke, made some, some pretty sharp comments, some, some pretty forceful comments, saying that uh, every day the brutal, these are his words, the brutal Russian aggression against Ukraine reminds us that the rule of law is not a given. So the sense that these are our nations very much coalescing in a common cause to defend freedom, yeah. to defend common values of human rights, and to defend common values of the rule of law, the international Order, if you will. Well, let's talk then a bit more about the legal ideas that, that yeah. Vladimir Zelensky raised today. He's, of course, speaking at The Hague. He talked once again about this crime of aggression. He said a special court needs to be set up to prosecute Russian crimes in Ukraine. Just tell us how that might theoretically work. Yeah. And what is a crime of aggression? Right. right? Because I think, you know, we assume you say the word aggression. What does it actually mean? As defined by the United Nations, a crime of aggression, and this wasn't always in the case, mm -hmm. it's in recent years that they've sort of tacked it on to the core crimes uh, that are under the jurisdiction, the aegis, if you will, of the International Criminal Court, of which I note Russia is not a member, doesn't recognize the court or jurisdiction in anything. But it had been up until recently crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide. Those had been the main competences, if you will, legally of the International Criminal Court. In recent years, they have amended, they have, they have added on uh, also the crime of aggression as defined by the United Nations, not by the court itself, by the UN. Uh, it's an invasion or attack by the, I'm reading the actual definition, or attack by the armed forces of a state on the territory of another state or any military occupation. Now, when you hear that, uh, and when Zelensky hears that, and when Zelensky's allies hear that definition, it could have been written, custom written, for what we have seen in the last 15 months. Actually not, in the last almost 10 years, uh, beginning with the initial Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014, and then the full-scale invasion uh, on February 24th of last year. Uh, the illegal occupation, uh, invasion of, of a sovereign country, uh, and so on and so forth. That is a crime of aggression. Now, why is a special tribunal needed if, as I just said, technically crime of, of aggression is one of the competences mm -hmm. of the International Criminal Court? There are a number of hitches here. Uh, Zelensky says, he, he says justice must come soon. You can't wait for this war to end. 
end, that it's it's timely and it must be expedited because, as he said once in, at another time, time is merciless. And the more time you wait, the more it plays into Russia's hands. People forget quickly. So what he wants is this tribunal because he fears that under the ICC, with a lot of people who aren't members, it has a long and very onerous prosecution process. All these crimes will fall by the wayside. He wants a tribunal tribunal that can dedicate itself to the specifically to the crime of aggression, as he sees it, waged by Vladimir Putin and his minions, okay, I'll use a less uh, editorial word, uh, his associates in power, uh, the, the, the military decision makers, the political decision makers who have allowed these attacks on cities, the atrocities, the brutalities we've seen from Bucha to Irpin to Mariupol and so on and so forth. He needs, you need the special tribunal, you need it now in order to ensure fair and lawful punishment of those responsible for these decisions. That's why it's become such a talking point, this idea of a special tribunal. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Will it be a Ukrainian tribunal? Will it be a mixed, a hybrid tribunal, Ukrainian, a little bit international? Will it be a purely international tribunal? Each of those questions, the answer to it has its own range of complications. But for now and today, the main takeaway is it's definitely there on the table, and about several dozen countries are working on the idea right now of that tribunal specifically to bring Vladimir Putin to justice along the lines of a Nuremberg-style trial that we saw in the wake of World War II uh, for the, the, the Nazis' crimes in invading and uh, occupying uh, countries. Douglas Herbert, thank you very much indeed for your analysis on 